Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. Um, what I will say is, Asim, at any point, if you want to just interject and come in or anyone else, I'm more than comfortable for you to, to do that. So um, just a brief introduction. Asim has given me a wonderful introduction. It's a little bit embarrassing. Um, apart from the Liverpool part, that I, I suggest all of you Man United supporters, you know, you come to the truth. This is part of the Dean. So I expect you to also join the Liverpool way. Um, but now, jokes aside, so what I'm going to try to do for you guys, right, is when I was about your age and when I was young, I really didn't have an interest in history. I found it pretty boring. It was um, at school. We were just remembering things that were not relatable. And in all honesty, when I was younger, I didn't find many, if any, Muslims making me feel interested in history at all. Um, what was interesting about going to school was that because we lived in England, we would go on school trips. Um, we would uh, get history lessons about living in London and, and so forth. And so one of the things that we could see is that it was relatable in that sense, in terms of, you know, um, you could see history living in the flesh. And that was important. As a Muslim, it was a little bit harder for me to see Islam's history in England. There have been some people who are trying to raise the history of Islam in the United Kingdom. But as a Muslim, as you know, we have a history that stretches beyond the shores of the, the, the British Isles. Some of us come from backgrounds um, where our parents are migrants who have come to this country. Um, and so they also have um, Islam in their countries and so forth. And so I wanted to know more about history and why it was important and, and so forth. Um, I traveled to Syria first to study Arabic and it was just a totally new world. I was blown away. I was like, wow, what's going on here? Totally different world for me. And then I moved to Istanbul and Istanbul was just a, a game changer for me. It was like eye opening to see these humongous buildings like mosques, which were, it's like seeing the Big Ben everywhere you go. It was just phenomenal for me in, to see that, you know, and, and to, to understand that. And, and when I was young, we were always made to believe that Muslims hadn't achieved monumental things. And when I came to Istanbul, went to Damascus, Muslims didn't say anything to me. I just saw it with my own eyes. And uh, that, um, f for me, of itself was, was just totally encapsulating the idea to be able to see the sort of like wonderful achievements that Muslims had achieved. Now, when I came back to England, I wanted to do a PhD in Ottoman history and history. And often the question is then asked, well, why is history important to us? And it's interesting because when I went to Madrasa as a kid, history wasn't on the curricula. Um, and as I've got older, I've started to ask myself, why is that the case? Why has that happened? Because everything we do is from the past. Everything we understand is the past. The conversation I'm having with you, it's, it's moving and it becomes the past. In that sense, everything that happens in the past shapes the way you are today. And for us as Muslims, what I noticed is that because when I was growing up, and I don't know how you feel as young, young guys in this sense, but growing up, I started to feel a sense of attack on Islam. Islam was being attacked. It was hard presenting my case as being a Muslim in British society. And, you know, I wanted to feel proud about something. I wanted to feel proud about what we did as Muslims and what we achieved. And so as a result, I would go back in time to see when we did that. And what I started to notice is that many of the achievements of the modern world, in particular, even today's civilization, is based on the Islamic past. What's interesting, though, is it all comes down to who writes history, who writes the past, right? Who writes history? And this is what I found interesting. What I noticed is that more and more young Muslims, when they're reading books on history or when they're watching shows on history, very rarely have Muslims written about the past. It hasn't come from a Muslim perspective. It's come from an outside perspective. And so sometimes it becomes difficult for those shows and those books to be relatable or well, sometimes it becomes difficult because the person who's writing about the Muslim experience sometimes hasn't quite caught on to the Muslim experience. They haven't caught on to what it is we feel and how we feel and so forth. So as, as a result of that, one of the things that I wanted to push in terms of you guys and want you to think about is as Muslims, um, how do we identify with our Islamic past? Our Islamic past of 1400 years that spans across continents and continents. We can go from China to Africa uh, to Europe, and you will see that Islam's impact in that sense has been 
monumental. And for me, so then what I wanted to know was, um, how, how do I fit into this? Why is it that I don't know enough? And I think we should know enough, in, in all fairness to you. I mean, I'll let you into a little secret. So I was watching Attack on Titans the other day with uh, a, a friend of mine, and there's a section where these guys, they're wearing fezzes. And I looked and I said, hey, those are the Ottomans. They're wearing fezzes and they're being blitzed. So the Malayans are blitzing these group of people on this anime that I was watching. And what I started to realize is that even in a Japanese anime, there's a particular imagination of Muslims and it's presenting Muslims from a posi position of weakness. And, and that sometimes shocks me and surprises me. So what I'm trying to say is even in popular culture, the historical understanding of Muslims in the past is, is shaped in a particular way. And that's not necessarily the case. And I want you to feel proud of this. I'm not trying to defend Islam because I feel inferior. Actually, I noticed that the way Islam was being presented was unfair. And so this is the thing that I want you to understand, that we have 1400 years of history. And in that 1400 years of history, um, you know, there's a 600 year block, which is Ottoman history, which is missing in our consciousness. And that's a long period that we don't know much about. Right. And I've said this before in terms of Allah Ta'ala speaking in the Quran about moments and events that have taken place in history. And Allah Ta'ala explains it in a particular way in which is it's storytelling to remind us so that we can be these events can be relatable for us so that we can see um you know who who is um so for example we've never met musa alayhi salam but Allah ta'ala tells us like um narratives of musa alayhi salam so that we can um identify with musa alayhi salam's struggle um yeah is that is true attack on titan is the history of the world and the titans are hidden <laughs> right um, and, um, you know, Allah Ta'ala talk, talks about the flood of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah Ta'ala gives us a wonderful surah on Yusuf alayhi salam. And these, these uh, uh, narratives and stories um, are important for us um, because to some degree, I give an example now, currently in pandemic, I was speaking to a friend. And when you read about the Anbiya in the Quran, you see many of them went through moments where they felt alone and isolated. Right. And now in pandemic, those stories of the Anbiya become important because many of us feel alone and isolated and we feel frustrated. And so we see that Allah Ta'ala had tested the, his beloveds. And in that sense, we can see how we can relate to that. So that's why I think history just in general, especially Islamic history, is important so that Muslims can find ways of relating to it. All right. Are there any questions apart from Attack on Titans and those of us who watch it and those of us who don't? I should have not, um, I should have stood like this actually, uh, just to help you understand. Are there any questions? So far we're doing okay? No. All right, so bear with me. I'm a little bit odd on this, so I'm not really great. So if I miss any of your hands or stuff. Okay, so I can kick on? Yeah, go ahead, Doc. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right, so in that sense, it's important to understand uh, who the Ottomans are, and I think this is the key thing. Why are they important? Well, one of the interesting things is what we start to see is that Islamic history is usually written from a perspective of, even now, it's a very Arab-centered writing of history, which is that we see history written from the Khulafa Rashidun, the Umayyads, and the Abbasids. And even that is quite limited, in fairness. But then what happens is we don't see the contribution of other Muslim peoples in regards to what they've done regarding Islam, right? And in the Ottoman case, what's interesting is near the tail end, which is the back end of the Abbasid period, we start to see the rise of, of the Turkic people's influence in South Asia, in Anatolia, and in what we would call the Persianate areas. So we mean, you know, um, Iran, Baghdad, and so forth, in these sort of, and Afghanistan. And so in these sort of areas, we see a, an influx, which is an increasing number of people which are um, of Turkic origin who are now becoming Muslim. And not only are they becoming Muslim, they are now bringing something to the table in regards to Islam. This becomes exceptionally important because under, it's under the Ottomans that not only do we see a shift towards Islam's movement into the West, right? So a lot of people don't know this, but a, it's not just in Andalusia, so in Spain, where Islam contributed, but under the Ottomans, Islam contributed in the Balkans. And the Balkans was perceived as part of European identity, as Muslims living in Europe. 
And in the Balkans, Islam contributed to such a degree that the Europeans, the Western Europeans, as we call them, were learning from Muslims in many ways. Albanians, Bosnians. Okay, so what are the Balkans? So the Balkan states is basically Bulgaria, um, Romania, um, Serbia, Bosnia, Albania, Kosovo, Greece. These areas here um, are named, uh, are considered the Balkan states. In the Ottoman period, they were called uh, Rumeli. Okay, Rumeli. So Rumeli basically means Rum. So the people of Rum, where Muslims had gone into the areas where Rum is considered, you know, um, the Romans, basically. And it's intriguing because earlier on, Rum was considered like, when you talk about Rumi, Mevlana Rumi, he's from Konya. So Konya was considered part of Rum at one point. So the idea is, is that in the Ottoman period, Rum is now considered Istanbul, which is Constantinople at the time, and the Balkan countries. And the Ottomans brought Islam to that area. So um, that is a really important thing to recognize. And at one point, um, that area was a powerhouse in regards to global politics. It doesn't feel like that today, but at one point it was. The second interesting thing is the conquest of Istanbul. And we'll talk about this in detail. The conquest of Istanbul changes the, not only the landscape in Europe, but it also changes the landscape in Islamic history. Never before had Muslims conquered an imperial power. It hadn't happened in this way. The Umayyads had defeated the Byzantines, or what we call the, the Eastern Roman Empire, um, in certain areas. Um, the Abbasids had defeated, you know, the Persianate Empire, which was in, which was collapsing, and then parts of the Byzantine Empire to some degree. But never before had Islam actually entered a humongous, what we call civilizational empire and take it in, in this shape. And the Ottomans, when they take Istanbul, it's a game changer. It's a game changer because Muslims had never. Um, achieved something of that nature before. The, the, you know, Muslims had conquered Baghdad, Damascus, and so forth. But these were not like what we're talking about, civilizational empires. The, 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 the defeat of Constantinople is the defeat of the Byzantines. The Byzantines are gone from the map. And now the Muslims have to deal with this um, power, which is the Byzantine imperial power and imperial culture, and, and place it in and, and make sense of it. So this is another interesting thing in regards to the Ottomans. The third thing is the question of the Khilafah in of itself. Um, the Ottomans become what you would say, a, the first Turkic peoples to become a, a Khilafah. The Mamluks and the Seljuks who are far more dominant and more powerful than the Abbasids at any particular time in Islamic history didn't push to become Caliphs. The Ottomans did. And that's an interesting question. How did the Ottomans become a caliphate? And not only did they become a khilafah, um, but their, what you would call domains, was larger than at any other time than any other khilafah in Islamic history. It was three continents. It was Europe, Asia, and Africa, you know? And this, so they, they, they ruled from what we can say, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, all the way down to Yemen, the Hejaz, so Mecca and Medina, um, Baghdad, parts of Russia, the Balkan states, and what we call Anatolia, today's Turkey. That's a phenomenal achievement um, in that context, right? And then what you start to see is later on, we start to see a, a the Ottoman Empire, sort of, if we're going to use that word loosely, the Ottomans start to um, collapse. And the collapse of the Ottomans left a huge hole in the Muslim world uh, in terms of authority, in terms of power, and in terms of an alternative civilization to the Western powers. And when we look at the creation of all the nation states that exist in the region today, it happens because of the collapse of the Ottomans. And it's interesting because they were all once part of the Ottomans. Um, not only that, okay, um, I'll get to this question in a second. So not only that, but also Pakistan was created, a lot of people don't realize this, was created on the back end of the collapse of the Ottomans. Um, the, the Muslims in Pakistan initially had put all their eggs in one basket of trying to save the Ottoman center, hoping that the Ottomans would defeat the British 
and that they could be almost, um, you know, um, uh, sort of like independent from the British yoke. And it was Kalam Azad who said that, you know, um, we want um, we want centers, we want large cities to be centers um, in that sense, right? And and so this was interesting. And then, uh, you know, um, the collapse of the Ottomans in the Muslim imagination, they pushed for the idea of having a Muslim state for Muslims. Um, and so this was happened. So, okay, so. So yes, all right, so let's look at the, the idea of a uh, Khalifa then uh, very quickly for you guys. And I would do it from the historical perspective. I think Asim is more qualified than me from the religious and theological perspective. So after the death of Rasul Salam, Rasul Salam is not a Khalifa because he's a prophet. And in that sense, Rasul Salam, in many ways, and I'm using it loosely, but he is the Islam in, in his, what you can call the embodiment of Islam. He's the walking, talking Islam for people, right? So he's the idea of Islam in that sense. When people see Rasul Salam, he's the idea of Islam. And at the same time, he's the, imp he's the method of Islam. He's the implementation of it. Whatever he was doing, people were following that. So after his death, what you can see is for Sayyidina Abu Bakr, the, the challenge of now, um, you know, um, sort of like um, implementing Islam without the Prophet, Rasul Salam, it, it was a humongous task. Because imagine Rasul Salam is, is, is this charismatic leader who everyone turns to. He's like a magnet, you know, he's like people are turning to him. And when he dies, the continuation of Islam is necessary. And what Sayyidina Abu Bakr does in his first sermon is he makes it very clear that I am not a prophet. I'm not a prophet in that sense, and I'm human and I'm going to make mistakes. And what he indicates then is that he's the one who follows. He's the shadow. In that sense, he can never be a prophet. No other prophets can come after Rasul Salam. In that sense, Abu Bakr is not going to bring any new deen. He's not going to bring any new idea. But what he's going to do as a caliph, is the leader of the Muslims, is that he's going to make sure that the implementation of Islam happens and that it's, nece it, it's, it's necessary that the Muslim Ummah has a leader who can represent the interests of the Muslims. And this continues throughout Islamic history and tradition. And it evolves and it shifts and it changes. We have the Khulafa Rashidun and then we have the Umayyads. And then we have the Abbasids, and then after that we have the Ottomans, and the manner in which the Ottomans had practiced um, Islam to some degree, and this is where um, they became monumental because their Khilafah or their Caliphate was very unique in Islamic history in the way that it operated. Okay, are there any questions so far? You say it, Doc, and I'll, I'll go there. Come on. So you see the Mamluk Devlity, that's the Mamluk state, the Mamluk state, uh, in which the Mamluks became the custodians and the representatives of the Khilafah in the Arab period. And you can see Halep here, which is Aleppo and Hama and so forth, and it goes further down. Now, if we skip all the way to the corner to the pink section where it says Byzantine Empire, this is the Byzantine Empire right in the corner here on the left. So if we keep going left. Come on, mate. Oh, I found it, I found it, yeah, I did yeah, yeah. yeah. right, cool. So this is the Byzantine Empire, obviously, in the um, uh, period. And so what we're seeing here, and what I wanted to show you is, after the Mongol invasion, after the Mongols totally def devastated the Muslim world, we see, we have a world which is broken up into little principalities, right? Little areas um, of little, and we have a lot of Turkic states, we call them Beyliks. So I'll write this for you, Beylix. And the word Beylix is basically, it's a, how can we explain it? It's um, principality is the word in English. There you go. Principality, principality right? And so it's, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a state, but it's not a, a very powerful, strong state with any really uh, definite infrastructure in many ways. And so what we're seeing at this period is many little states, and this is the world that the Ottomans are introducing to, right? That the, the, the Mongol invasion has totally decimated um, the, the region and it's allowed local leaders uh, and local peoples, and some of them are warlords, some of them are famous families, some of them are tribes, and this is where you get this issue of Arturul from. The Arturul is, is part of the Kaya tribe, a small tribe that emerges in this period in many ways um, and, and this is a tribe that's trying to survive in this messy world that we live in. 
in that sense. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the Ottomans arrived to the scene, and this is a, the thing that I wanted to make the case, which is that, um, you know, how is it that the Ottomans go from the Kaya tribe to the Ottomans? How do they become that, right? And this is an interesting thing, because in the early period of Ottoman history, they would have identified as being part of the Kaya tribe. But what's interesting here is that clearly, um, later on in Ottoman history, especially when Fatih conquers Istanbul, um, the idea is, is that the Ottomans need a name for themselves. And uh, could you spell that? We'll do it like this, the Kaya tribe, like this. But this is, in English, it would be like this, Kaya. But in Turkish, it's Kayu, and they use a capital I like that. Okay, they have a, so in Turkish, for those of you guys who don't know, we have two I's in Turkish. We have an I of a dot, we have a regular I, and we have an I of a dot. We have two I's in Turkish, and one is E, and one is Ö. It's an interesting language in that sense. So the Kaya is a Kaya tribe, uh, no, um, with an I that's a, without the dot. Um, but in English, you would say it like that, Kaya, like that, right? So Ertuğrul's tribe, which was known as the Kaya tribe, um, to that degree. Um, but by the time the Ottomans conquer Istanbul or Constantinople, um, people are asking the question, who are the Ottomans in, in many ways? And it's in, to some degree, um, power needs to um, recognize another form of power. So one of the interesting things, and in, I'll explain this in detail when we have the next session, is when Bayezid is Yildirim, Yildirim means thunderbolt, the reason why he's the thunderbolt is because he was conquering many of these small little areas we saw. When he went to war with Timurlane uh, from uh, um, uh, East Asia, um, Timur asks him, like, you know, I, who are you? And he says, I am Bayezid, um, you know, um, um, descendant of Osman and part of the Kaya tribe. And for Timur, Timur finds this strange and goes, what's the Kaya tribe? I am Timurlane you know, descendant of Genghis Khan, the Mongol. So what you see is that this sort of thing becomes important in terms of self-identification and sort of like projecting yourself. So, you know, like some of you guys, when you're telling me that you're Man United supporters, right? The reason why you say, we're Man United supporters, we won the league this many times, we're the greatest club in the world, blah, 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 blah. And then Liverpool supporters go, hang on a minute, what are you talking about? We're the greatest club in the world. We've won the league 19 times. You know, we won the Champions League recently. We're the defending champions and so forth. What you see then is it's important or it becomes important. Uh, yes, he, so Genghis Khan was dead. But the interesting thing about Genghis Khan is he left a legacy. This is the, the reason why I mentioned Man United and Liverpool is these clubs have left a legacy, right? And when you leave a legacy behind, you leave a history behind. And when you leave a history behind, you become... <laughs> you become important in many ways. And so for the Ottomans, they needed to create a name for themselves. And so to be um, somebody independent, because while the Kaya tribe was a small tribe, by the time the Ottomans come onto the scene in Istanbul, they become somebody who's, 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 um, who, who the Europeans are looking at, and they've recognized that they are significant. And so what we have is um, the, the, the narrative that is in 1324. And this is interesting because, you know, um, in Islamic history, by and large, um, yeah, we can, you can go to the next scene. It's not a problem. I'll, I'll explain the tree. Uh, so in, 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 in Islam, generally, dates, we look at them very differently than in, in European society, right? So in European society, for example, Western society in particular, um, the modern period has put in our imagination that we need to know when something started. When, when's the beginning date? When did this begin? When's your birthday? When were you born? And so forth. But in Muslim societies, by and large, dates didn't operate in the same way. They usually remembered events. And this tells you something about how Muslims remember something. So in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala remembers of the year of the elephant, right? And he explains it in this way. And this is why sometimes when we're looking at certain events in Islamic history, we're trying to figure out how old someone is or how young someone is. It becomes tricky because it, to some degree, dates were not as significant. The events were more important in, for the people who were writing the history. That's what they were more em, um, emphasized. So my mother, I'll give you an example, my mom, like you guys are going to crack up, but I, I once called a, 
uh, the bank for my mum because my mum's English is not great. And they asked me my mum's date of birth and I didn't know it. And so I looked at my mum and I said, what's your date of birth? And the people on the phone thought I was faking it and they locked my mum's account. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, because I should have done the safe thing, which is every Pakistani mother's birthday is the 1st of January, right? But um, I, I asked her, what's your real date of birth? And even my own mother, she goes, you know, I was roughly born when there was a flood in Karachi and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, and you'd be surprised when I used to go to Pakistan and even in Syria, when we used to ask people street names, they didn't know the names of streets. They said, where do you want to go? I want to go to such and such bit. Oh, it's next to the post office. Just walk down the street. There's a post, there's a butcher. Take a left after the butcher. You see a police station, then take a right. There's a post office is next to that. So it's intriguing what I'm trying to explain to you is how things are explained. And so in the Ottoman period, we really don't know the beginning of the Ottoman period in terms of the date. But what we do know is an event that takes place that seems to be of interest to Ottoman historians. And that's Osman's dream, right? So the first, uh, so um, the son of Ertuğrul Ghazi, or Osman, um, he has a dream. And the interesting thing about this dream is that um, Adabali, um, who is the sheikh at the time, he goes to the sheikh and he's interested in the sheikh's daughter. The sheikh's not interested in him, in, in giving his hand in marriage to his daughter at this moment in time. And, uh, you know, Osman then starts to, he goes into a room and he prays. And one of the interesting narratives of this, and I, we'll, we can't prove it whether it is true or not, but it's interesting how this, this narrative is important for Muslims. I think that's important to understand. Is that he goes into the room and he refuses to lie down because he knows that there's a Quran in the room and he doesn't want to put his feet near the Quran. And so he, he, they say he stands sleeping um, on the first night because he's nervous. Then he realizes he takes the Quran, he starts to read it and he goes to sleep with the Quran on his chest and then he has this dream. And in this dream is the moon comes out of his chest and then, and, and then the, the tree, which is this tree that you see here, which is the oriental plane tree, in Turkey is called uh, Chiran, the name of the tree is Chiran. And, and basically this tree grows out of his chest and many branches grow from this tree and many leaves grow in it and so forth. And this totally shocks um, Osman for having this dream. And what he does is he goes to Edibali and he explains to him this dream that he had. And Edibali then says to him that this dream is an indication that you're going to be somebody powerful and you're going to have a long famous lineage and from your lineage will come many rulers and many peoples of, of authority and so forth. And then obviously he marries Adibali's daughter and they lived happily ever after. Um, but what, what's interesting about this tree, which is this is not the only time we see this tree because this tree is very unique. The Ottomans would plant this tree in significant places in, in the Ottoman world. So whenever you see a tree like this in Istanbul or in Turkey, independently standing there, doing absolutely nothing. Um, what you um, okay, that's it. will notice is that tree, the oriental plane tree, has been planted by somebody because the place was of significance. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Ayub al-Ansari, uh, when you go to Ayub in Istanbul, for any of you who get the opportunity, inshallah, to come to Istanbul, and if you do come, please give me a shout and I'll show you around after the pandemic is over, of course. Um, what, what you'll see is that um, this tree um, is planted in Ayub. And it's because they planted this tree here, because it's intriguing how they used a tree as a symbol, not only of, this, of Osman's dream, but in some ways they used the tree as a marker of something which is important and significant. They could have put a stone down, they could have put a stick in the ground, they could have built a monument, but they didn't do that. They actually planted these oriental plane trees, which I found, for me, is really fascinating to, to see that. So if you ever, guys, ever, um, you know, walk around Istanbul or Turkey and you see one of these trees standing independent, not in a group of trees, but just one tree independent, understand that this something significant has happened in Ottoman history, and this is uh, the, the case, okay? So um, Osman's dream then has a play on words. The idea, yeah, Ibrahim Khan is indeed trying to buy lots of these trees. Hopefully somebody can teach him about these particular trees. 
Um, so in Osman's dream, it's a play on word. One that Osman had a physical, he actually had a dream. But other, the, 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 the use of the word Osman's dream is to indicate he also had this ambition that he wanted um, to be somebody who was of significance, right? So in that sense, you see the idea of Osman's dream. And it's this play on word that they use in this context. Now, why this is important is because in the West, there is an attempt to sometimes uh, relegate dreams as being non-important in Muslim culture. Okay, and this is an intriguing idea because when we see um, um, Osman, we see Fatih's conquest of Istanbul and find, finding the tomb of Ayub, Selim's conquest of, of the Mamluks and finding the tomb of uh, Ibn Arabi, these are all based on dream interpretations, that they had particular dreams. We see even Abdul Hamid II, Rahimallah, he has particular dreams. Um, and Abdul Hamid was really, um, it's popularly known that he would ask people to interpret dreams, right? Now what's intriguing here is that in the West, when we're doing Western history, when we're doing history about the Ottomans, we relegate dream interpretation as something which is insignificant. And yet I think whether as Muslims you want to be convinced by this dream or not, I still believe we should incorporate the narratives of the dreams to at least understand that these were part of the form of self-identification, that they saw these dreams and so forth. And I think this is important in that sense. So this is why the, the narrative of Osman's dream becomes significant, because whether it's true or not, it's difficult to know. But the fact that this narrative is so strong, in, it shouldn't be just dismissed either. I think this is something we should take into consideration in that sense. Another Dr. thing Yaku, that happened... Go ahead. We, we had a couple of questions before, so oh. I mean, very quickly about the yeah. Mongols. Yeah. So Zayn asked, didn't Burke Khan, Zayn Khan asked, didn't Burke Khan of the Golden Horde help fight off the Mongols with the Turks? And Rais asks, at the outset of the Ottoman um, Empire's rise, was the Mongol Empire the strongest or largest empire? So, uh, okay, in, in regards to the Mongol dynasty in itself, there are many Turkic bailiffs who did fight against the Mongols to some degree. And it's difficult to know whether the, the Mongol state was the largest state at the time, because the Mongols were a group of people that kept moving from one horde to another. So it's really difficult. They, they didn't actually operate in the same way of trying to amass giant landmass in, in the same way. It was very difficult in the way. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Game of Thrones or not. It depends how old you are. But there's a group of people called the Dothraki. The Dothraki are supposed to represent the Mongols to some degree. It's one of the interesting things I keep telling you guys, right? That um, people today don't have an imagination. They still have to draw from the past to try to use um, imaginations of people in, in that sense. But the Mongols were definitely a, a large state or empire, if you want to call it that. But the size is difficult to know because they, they, the entities were shifting and moving at any given time, at any given moment. But what we can say is during the rise of the Ottomans um, that the Mongols are a significant force. Um, that's definitely true. And the Seljuks are also a significant force at the time. So, so Dr. Yaqub, you're saying that the Mongols weren't a conventional empire to be able to ascertain how much land they controlled. Yeah, that's like, right. It was more nominal. Like they were in charge, but they weren't really there. They were constantly going back that's and right. forth. That's yeah. right. It, and, and actually, we get this even, we see this in the Ottoman period. The word dola, or, and in Turkish they use the word devlet, it means something which is rotating all the time, right? Something which is moving all the time from one place to another. And the reason why this is important is because the Ottomans were known initially as being a Ghazi empire or a Ghazi group of people, a people who would go on the guzzle, who would go to fight. And so what happens is you see that their devlet is rotating and moving, rotating and moving. So they go from Sot, which is the Kaya tribe, to Bursa, to Edirne, and then they go to Istanbul, Constantinople. And it's only when they land in Constantinople um, do they become what you would call a sedentary state, which means a state, a devlet that stays. So no longer were they moving from one center to another. Now there's an importance of moving centers. Why? Because when you're a group of people, you fight, you move. You fight, you move. You fight, you move, right? You keep rolling in this way. Yeah, so, okay, thanks for this next slide. And, and what you start to see in the Ottoman case is this constant rolling because they're moving towards um, east further and further.
But once they conquered Istanbul, because Istanbul, Constantinople was an empire, and they took an imperial city, they couldn't roll off and just leave it. They had to stay and consolidate the authority there. And in some ways, um, while the Byzantines became the Ottomans in the sense that Constantinople became Istanbul, um, even though it was called Istanbul before, but what I mean by this is that um, it moved from a Christian Orthodox empire to a Muslim entity, um, but you nonetheless see that the the impact of the Byzantine idea of imperial power stays with the Ottomans. We got to stay now. We're an imperial power. We're, we're powerful now, and this is our home. And there's no need to keep rolling. And so what happens is the meaning of devlet, dola, it changes from something which is moving to something which represents state power. And the word dola then meant the area, the domains, as we say the domains of the Muslim space in that sense, right? So why are the Ottomans important? So we've seen the rise of the Turkic peoples, that's one. And the next point I want is a formation of state building. The Ottomans were fascinating in regards to how they built their dola, their devlet. They were architects of state building. Um, so they moved from a nomadic culture, which was a culture of, of as we said about the, the Mongols, very loosely defined state to a bureaucratic organized state in which they built institutions and they built infrastructure and that's very unique for the ottomans in the way that they did that um okay uh yes exactly thanks a lot Asim, for helping then the other interesting thing we see was the emergence of organized sufism uh, in the sense that it was part of the state building process so when Osman, for example, uh, we talked about Edebali. So Edebali was with Osman when he's emerging as a young leader um, in that sense. And so we spoke about dream interpretation and, uh, initially. And so what we start to see is not only in terms of dervishes, but the establishment of tariqat culture taking place with the Ottomans and that people who were um, uh, ulama of a Sufi tradition were supporting the Ottoman state in terms of his activities. Okay. Virtually every Ottoman um, sultan or leader had a sheikh that they consulted in. Um, in the 19th century, they didn't have some some of the uh, ulama. I mean, sorry, some of the sultans didn't have a specific sheikh. By the 19th century, they had multiple sheikhs and multiple peoples they turned to as the tariqat culture um, evolved and become far more um, in tune with the times of the 19th century. So. Um, we see in Fatih's case, Mehmed Fatih, when he conquers Constantinople, he also Akshab Sadin is his, his personal sheikh at the time. We see um, in the case of Salim as well, having a personal sheikh. We see the case of the 19th century onwards, that the Naqshbandi movement in particular is very close to uh, the House of Osman. And a lot of the reforms that are happening are under the, the influence of the Naqshbandi tariqa in particular. Sultan Abdul Hamid II was surrounded by many um, uh, uh, Sufi sheikhs uh, uh, at the time and what we see is um, a lot of the um, if you ever come to Istanbul um, you'll see the difference between a mosque and a zawiya there's, there's complete difference in them and um, there are a lot of zawiyas they call them tekkes here in Istanbul and uh, these were spaces for people um, to um, to obviously do zikr but also you have an area like if you ever come to Istanbul, there's a place called uh, Yahya Effendi. Yahya Effendi was the, the milk brother of Suleiman the Magnificent or Al-Kanuni. And his complex is fascinating because a lot of people say, how is it that Yahya Effendi has so much money when he's a Sufi? Uh, well, for Yahya Effendi, he actually used that money to open up madrasas and schools and educational institutions. And he helped a lot of Muslims with that money. So there's nothing in Islam that says just because you're a Sufi, you're not allowed to make money uh, in, in any shape or form. Okay, so Ayan is asking, what is the Naqshbandi movement? Okay, the Naqshbandi is a particular tariqat, Sufi tariqat, that came from India, the Asia subcontinent, and then they got prominence in the Caucasus in Russia. And in the 19th century, scholars from the tariqat made their way, or the tariqa, they made their way to Istanbul, and they became very influential in Istanbul. And then you have uh, uh, an offshoot of that, which is the Khalidiyah branch, which became very prominent in Damascus with Sheikh Khalid. And um, 
this was a, a, a tariqat of a Sunni um, Sufi orientation, which was very influential in the 19th century for the Ottomans in many ways. And it was the, the idea of the tariqat was to um, bring back to the fore um, what you would call um, Sunnism, the Sharia, um, uh, Tawhid, and they had a very anti-colonial bent, which is a lot of things people don't understand. They had a strong anti-colonial um, um, component to them. And it's very fascinating because a lot of people make the assumption that the Sufis in the Ottoman period were apolitical. They were not apolitical. They were very political. So Sheikh um, Shamin... What do, you mean, Sufis, what do you mean by apolitical? Would you mind? They, they, so the word apolitical basically indicates that they were independent from any political decision making. And what you see is that they were not independent. They actually felt that um, if you could influence power, then power can do good. It's their belief, right? So if you are independent from power, then so one of the interesting things is that there's a belief that the ulama, and at this time, many Sufi sheikhs were members of the ulama class. They believed that talking truth to power was to encourage power to do good, right? Um, there's a particular um, academic right now, and I don't want to confuse you, but I want to just put this out there. He says that today's day, power should speak truth. This is very impractical in the eyes of the ulama. The ulama always felt that how can power speak truth? Because it's power. But what you need is people who can speak truth to power, who can guide power, who can talk to power. Because power in itself it can, can at times have corrupting um, positions. So in that sense, um, the, the Nakshis in particular, we call them, um, in the 19th century onwards, they became very influential in, in many of the um, reform activities that took place in the late Ottoman period because they believed that um, Islam provided what they called tajdid, some sort of level of an Islam reform, and um, they were pushing for that. And it's really fascinating. We'll talk about that in detail when we get to that class. But it's important to, to remember that. And the last thing is what the Turks did. Yeah, it's an overview. Really sorry, people. Um, and, and the last thing I want to talk about is the consolidation of Sunnism. What the Ottomans did is at, 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 at they, they, in many ways, in fairness, I, I think this is the Seljuks did this first. Actually, the Seljuks and the Mamluks did this first. So we have to give props to the Seljuks and Mamluks. But then to the Ottomans is that they consolidated a particular vision of Sunni Islam. At a time when the Mongols had totally devastated the region, um, what they did is they reconsolidated the idea of Sunnism in the region. And then you see a, a sort of like emergence of the Safavids and Twelver ideas. But by and large, what the Ottomans did is they consolidated the idea of Sunni Islam. And this is interesting because not many people often give the Turkic people this credit, but they deserve that credit to some degree, that they did achieve this um, and, and so on. So. And uh, Shawal is keep saying I'm leaving and joining a group. Don't worry, we're, we're not judging you, bro. It's all it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm not getting offended. In that sense, do you want to go to the next? Like, do, do you guys have any questions? Go on, go for it. Yeah, I, I'm just going to warn, like, guys, um, yeah. remember, Dr. Yaqub is going to break up the 600-year Ottoman period into three separate sessions after this. So he's just trying to give you an understanding of um, the systems that the Ottomans utilized and how they saw religion and stuff. So if you're finding some of this a bit confusing, ask away any questions you might have. But it will be fleshed out a bit more as we go through the weeks, inshallah ta'ala. But if you guys have any questions right now, this would be a good chance to ask okay. before we move on, inshallah. Um, I think there was a question that um, Ali had where he asked, was a sheikh like a personal advisor? And yeah, maybe yeah. you could expand on the idea of a Zawiya. What was a Zawiya or a Teke? Okay, sure. So a Zawiya or a Teke is basically, so um, it's funny, when um, Hamza Makbul came here, um, he started doing zikr in, 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 in a mosque in Bursa, and I was just, I was freaking out. I was freaking out. And some Turks came up, and everyone, they are, the Turks asked me, what's going on in there? And I laughed and I said, oh, they're foreigners, they don't understand. Because in Turkey, you don't do zikr, collective zikr, you don't do it in a mosque. The mosque is, it was a religious space for salah, and it was a, it was a space for power, for the Jumma khutbah. And in essence, that's what it was. A tekke or zawiya was an area of space independent from the, the, what we would call the masjid or, and the madrasa system, in which people can practice um, not only in terms of um, zikr, 
but they would have soup kitchens where people would would invite people and it would be as you could say a center a center where people can practice um you know forms of zikr and uh, piety and austerity so you know like i said sharing money inviting people discussing and so forth and they had their, these were independent space like a food bank yeah that's good yeah well done um and these were these independent spaces and so in the ottoman domains they had these two distinct spaces um mainly because um the the mosque and the madrasa system was in the domains of the ulama and not every alim was part of a tariqat or tariqa there were some alims who were independent from that there were some alims who joined tariqats there are other alims who didn't okay so as a result the ottoman madrasa and mosque system was independent from from that but many tariqats they had their own spaces where they would practice uh, their sufi traditions in the way they saw fit so there was the naqshbandi tariqat there was the halwati tariqat there was the Mevlevi Tariqat, um, there was the Qalandari Tariqat, and, uh, and so forth. And so what you start to see is that each Tariqat had his own way of, of doing zikr, each Tariqat had his own chain of sheikhs, and so forth. And so they had their own structures and buildings, and the Ottomans allowed that and facilitated that. What's even more interesting is that from time to time, different Tariqats would get the ear of the Sultan. So it was always important for a tariqat to get the ear of the sultan because if a particular tariqat got the ear of the sultan they would know that the sultan would allow them to promote um you know their values allow them to build buildings and so forth and so in the 19th century um we got an an, an increase of the nakshis in particular who had um and the nakshis are really unique because it's it's known in islamic history in particular in ottoman history that the Nakshis never asked the Sultan for every, for anything. But um, one of the interesting things that they did do is they were a tariqat which was closer to power than any other tariqat in uh, the history of Ottoman history. So what does Zayn say? Is it true that Osman killed his uncle Dundar Bey for disobeying him? Um, I don't know if he killed him for disobeying him or if he killed him for, for treason. Um, which is So there's a difference between disobeying someone and 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 being treasonous uh disobeying someone is just saying go to the shops and buy me some milk and say no i'm not doing that um but treasonous is when you do something which is to the detriment of your community to the state and to islam and i think there were people who were killed um in regards to doing what we would call treasonous activity in the beginning there's no way of us knowing in reality like what the details were and i'll tell you why because when you're um, when you're not famous, you don't have a lot of information written about you. I give an example of myself. There, you're not going to find information about me when I was a child, when I was a kid, because I wasn't famous. I'm not famous now, but now you can find YouTube videos of me because I'm a PhD graduate and people see me. It's the same with Rasul Salam. When we do Sira, the the the, the early lives of Sira of Rasul Salam, the information it just jumps. We do what we call time skips, right? Also, some bang, bang, bang. But when he gets to Medina, um, then you have a lot of information on Rasulullah. And the battles, there's a lot of information because by now he's established as a prophet, he's established as a leader of the state. And so there's a lot of people documenting, right? And so in the early Ottoman period, one of the things I want to make or instill in your minds is that we don't have a lot of information. And as a result of that, as a historian, I'm always careful if, if, if we can push things home all the time because it's dependent on, on, on making assumptions. Anything else? Um, is this, is this um, you trying to say, don't ask me questions about Ertuğrul, it's not real? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, <laughs> listen, look, I, okay, I want to make this clear. Uh, okay. So, for those of you who enjoy Ertuğrul, uh, just like I enjoy Attack on Titans, I'm just saying that it's a TV show. It's hard to... Um, have that amount of detail in a TV show like that because we don't have the information on it. Having said that, I don't mind the idea of Arturul because I think as, an, as a concept, what it attempted to achieve, I still think it was very beneficial. And I think, um, but we, we have a saying in English, you can speak more truth in fiction than sometimes in history. So the idea is, is that 
um, in Turkey in particular, there was ways of projecting particular values and ideas in the show of Ertuğrul because um, you had a lot more flexibility. Whereas I guess if you're writing history proper, then historians get involved and critique you. So um, I guess this is what happened with Ertuğrul. But people get disappointed when I say that. Is, that. is it true that Sultan Fatih became Sultan at 13? Sultan Fatih did become Sultan at 13, 14, I think he was, um, in 1421, 1444, for two years, he became Sultan. And then uh, people complained that he was too young. So his father came back to power. So his father, Murat II, um, was in power and just abdicated. It's the first time it happened in Ottoman history. He said, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm out. So Fatih then comes into power. And then people complain, they say Fatih is too young. So then Murad comes back to power in 1446 to 51, which upsets Fatih. And then Fatih conquers Istanbul, they say about 19, 20 years old, which is a phenomenal feat. And in Turkey, fathers say this to the kids all the time. Look at you playing PlayStation. How comes you're playing PlayStation when Fatih conquers Istanbul, you know, at 19 years old? Shame on you. So this is a very common thing that we hear in Turkey in that sense, you know, but uh, um, I have no problem with you guys playing PlayStation or Nintendo Switch, so long as the game is pretty safe. And as long as you're praying your salah and you don't become addicted and all of the that's, other caveats. That's right, that's right. We, 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 one of the interesting things. Okay, so Murad II is my favorite Ottoman Sultan. Oh, wow, okay. Why would they have chosen Ertuğrul to base their show on rather than any other famous Ottoman Sultan? Okay. So basically what happened, at, um, Adam, is that in Turkey there was a particular rule um, that they were not allowed to depict political leaders in TV shows. And... So the Turks were really reluctant to do TV shows on famous leaders because there was a fear that they would start to do a TV show on the founder of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal. And so as a result of that, um, one of the cultures they have in, in Turkey is to not to, to denigrate or to critique leaders or political leaders in Turkey uh, on television. In this, it's, against, uh, it's, in, it's in the Turkish constitution to some degree. And what they did is they extended that out to Ottoman history. They extended it out to not have shows on, on Ottoman sultans. Now, a few, 10 years back, I can't, oh, it's amazing, it's been 10 years. They did a show on Suleiman the Magnificent. And because there was a sense of relaxation in this government. And so they did a show on Suleiman the Magnificent. And the show was very popular in Turkey. People liked it. But some Muslims were agitated because it wasn't showing Suleiman's uh, um, um, successes in regards to the Ghazal, it was showing Suleiman's intrigue regarding his wife, Hurrem, and so forth. And this sort of frustrated Muslims. So what they did is Muslims then wanted to counter that show by having their own show. And they were looking at the types of people they could look at in regards to history. And what they felt was that by doing Arturul in particular, that they would have more flexibility. They had tried the show of Fatih and it didn't do too well. And that's because everyone knows so much about Fatih. So what they attempted to do, I think the producers, is they wanted to bring a figure which wasn't known and it would give them more flexibility to write about. And then they could, and they didn't expect, they really didn't expect the show to be this popular. They really didn't know that because it was done for Turks. It wasn't done for Muslims around the world. They didn't know that Muslims wanted to see a positive Muslim on TV. They didn't know that Muslims, you know, still believed in the, in, in the concept of being honorable, of being loyal, of being upright, and so forth. This was outside of the, the, the producer's imagination. They just wanted to, to make a show for Turkish Muslims in Turkey in this way. And, and Ertuğrul was an easier person to do it with because um, he was just outside the Ottoman remit. So if the show failed, they wouldn't be critiqued of, you know, um, de denigrating the Ottoman legacy. And if the show did well, then, then they can do more Ottoman-related uh, individuals. And the show did exceptionally well. And then, as we say, the rest is history. Right? Uh, any other questions? I think we're good to move on to... Uh, oh, Ali has one question. So I heard that Nakshibandi leader Maulana Sheikh Nazim lived in northern Cyprus. Is there a certain... Yeah, because he was from Cyprus. He was born in Cyprus. Um, so he was Cypriot, um, and that's why he lived in Cyprus um, to that degree. Okay, okay. so this is Fatih and, and Selim. Um, as I said to you before, so Fatih's period is interesting because it's the emergence, and this is Fatih on the left, 
This is a famous painting that we had in the United Kingdom, by the way. Um, I don't know if any of you got to see this painting, which was in the the, um, the, the natural the National Art Museum in Trafalgar Square. The one on the left, that is the one with um, not the the ones with the soldiers. And this painting was bought by the Turks more recently, by the mayor of Istanbul. He bought this painting on the left um, as a way of celebrating Fatih because Fatih is a very celebrated figure in this country. And then he was undercut because Erdogan opened up Hagia Sophia. And um, then, you know, it politically, it also um, smashed him as well. So this is how they depicted Fatih. This is a European Italian painter who did this. And the painting on the right is, you know, a, a constant painting that we see of the celebration of Fatih's conquest of Istanbul or Constantinople at the time. And you see that there's an alim in the painting. And, and there's also um, an individual who is black and so forth. And uh, this, this idea um, of, of the sort of like um, cosmopolitan nature of, of Fatih's conquest um, in Istanbul. So Fatih, uh, as we know from the from Surah Fatiha, also means uh, the opening or to open. And it's interesting in Islam and, and even in English, we use the word opening, to open. We don't actually, we're reluctant as historians, even myself, to use the word conquer or conquest which has a negative meaning. But in Islam, amongst ourselves at least anyway, we, we try to use the term to open a land. Because the idea is, is to open a land for Islam and then you remove the obstacles that are in the way to, to restrict the promoting of Islam. But we, in no shape or form, force people to become Muslim. And what we see in Fatih's period is that Fatih actually conquered the Balkans first. So Kosovo was conquered before Constantinople, Istanbul, right? And what we see in the Balkans is the majority of the people never converted to Islam. The Ottomans never forced them to convert to Islam. And the early Ottoman domains had more Christians than they had Muslims. And this is an important thing to remember. The non-Muslims were living under Muslims and we didn't force them to convert. We didn't abuse them in any way. They accepted and understood what it meant to live under Islam. And fact, this is why Fatih's conquest of Istanbul or, or Constantinople is so important because it makes this case um, of, of how one of the few times, well, one of the most significant times in Islamic history, non Muslims were living under Muslims in this context. And so, this is what I mean by Fatih's period being a game changer in regards to um, Islam and the history of Islam. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide for me? Okay, so this was. Um, were the, the the Ottoman domains at the times and the, the question was being asked well which was what was the Balkans and as you can see it's Bulgaria it's Greece it's and and um, parts of um, uh, what we would call um, Albania Kosovo Serbia and, and this sense and the Ottomans were very close to Rome and actually Fatih did have ambitions of conquering Rome um, but he died while his fleets made it to the Italian shores. The Italians were very nervous, in fact, um, in this sense. And um, one of the interesting things about Fatih is that the Greek Orthodox Church became under the authority of Fatih, the Sultan of Istanbul, in this sense. And so you start to see that um, Fatih, what Fatih allowed the Greeks was to use his area to some degree to be able for the Greeks to, to promote their version of Christianity to other Christians, um, if they saw fit. And he, he allowed them to use his networks. So the idea that, you know, on the one hand, Fatih came to destroy Christianity, he didn't. Instead, the Christians became under the authority of the Muslims in this way. And this was um, Fatih's reign in, in, in that sense. Um, if we um, go to the next one. Just just before we, we move on, I mean, this Fatih is obviously a very yeah. um, interesting topic. So if anybody has any questions for Sultan Fatih, someone has a question actually, uh, Ustad, if you can see that, then I have a question after that potentially. But. Um, who, was, who was the emperor? Um, uh, Constantine oh, the 11th. Constantine, I think it was Constantine, yeah. Who was the emperor at the time of Fatih. What's interesting in Constantine's case, I mean, like in the Fatih movie, they present him as a very negative character. In actuality, he wasn't that negative um, as a person. But um, when they never found his body, which is interesting. So when Fatih conquered the Istanbul, they never found his body. We have another question. So do you think if Fatih did conquer Italy, would the Ottomans still be around? It's a very difficult question, to be honest with you. Um, one of the things that I've always, I was always taught in my teachers in the madrasa, not in academia, was never to speculate if. You can only go on what you have. 
Um, if they, my, my, my Haji used to tell me, if it's from the shaitan, I used to, we used to laugh as kids. But the idea is, is that if Fatih had done that, and if Fatih had done this, yes, of course, the, the, the world might have been different, but what we have to go on is Qadr Allah, this is what happened, and we have to go on what happened as historians. Um, and Allah Ta'ala in his wisdom uh, chose what he saw fit. Um, in that sense, um, we, we really, there's no way of knowing. It's very possible that Fatih would have conquered um, Italy and something else might have transpired. Um, so uh, it's difficult to know. So I, I always feel that these types of questions um, are always difficult to answer when when you guys ask me because we really, I, I, I'm I more of the inclination of what my Hodja used to teach me when I was young, which was rather than speculating on what could have happened, we should work on what did happen in that sense. Okay, uh, Constantine the 11th. Okay, was the rise of the Ottoman uh, Amina simultaneous to the decline of the Roman? Yes, it was. To some degree, the, the rise of the Ottomans is at the same time um, you're starting to see a, a particular fall away in the Byzantine and Roman uh, states. You know, the, the, the Christians themselves had been fighting each other for a very long time, um, and, and they, had, they had bludgeoned each other. One of the interesting things people don't realize is the inter-Christian contestation that was taking place amongst each other. And um, in that sense, the Christians had hurt each other. I mean, Constantinople had been smashed by the, the Crusaders on many occasions. They had raided it and, and really butchered it on, on many occasions when they went in. So there were these internal contestations that were taking place. And yes, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, as we say, was uh, weak, weaker. And this was, and this is why Fatih then took the, or Mehmed Fatih, as we call him, he took the opportunity this is, we'll talk about this in detail when it comes, but you know, there was a difference of opinion amongst his soldiers. There's a group of people that believed that he should not have taken Istanbul. He should have left it because it would have created different problems for them. And, um, but Fatih felt that this was an opportun opportunity of a lifetime because of a particular form of weakness that he had heard regarding Constantinople. And, uh, you know, so his father Murat, his father Murad, actually, and this is, we'll talk about this uh, Chandalili Pasha because people always ask me, why was Chandalili Pasha executed? And we'll talk about this in detail. But his father Murad was of the impression that Istanbul should not be conquered, that we should have diplomatic relations with the Byzantines, and that we should have, this is peacetime, and that we, we don't have the resources to take men to go to Constantinople. But Fatih um, went ahead. Now, um, Osman's question is, did Sultan Fatih have a dream before he conquered Istanbul? He didn't have a dream before he conquered Istanbul in the sense that he had a dream one year before. He had a dream while he was on the Ghazal. Or Akshab Saddin had a dream. While we we're not sure if it's Akshab Saddin or Fatih who had the dream during the Ghazal period. Because there's one period during the Ghazal where the walls are not coming down and, and, and Fatih's troops are becoming demoralized at the fact that they're not being able to conquer Constantinople. And it's then that we hear of um, Fatih's Sheikh, Akshab Sandin, he has a dream. And he comes to Fatih and he says, you will be successful. It will happen. And, and then Fatih pushes ahead and he takes his men and he goes, keep going. And, they, and this is when they take the boats, they go over the hill, they come around the back and so forth. So that's where the, the dream uh, comes from in that context just a, just a quick point before we go oh. to sultan salim mm. this is the point from and I, I i i you know the idea that the ottomans now saw themselves as the roman emperor yeah they said a room mm. yeah yeah and, and it's because th that's what they became no doubt about it you know they became the, the 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 successors of the romans in some so you know in english we have a saying which is all roads lead to rome that doesn't mean rome it means constantinople and you can see the map you got the map there, you see the way Constantinople is, everything leads to it. But Rome is like, you know, that football shaped foot. And when I used to watch uh, Italian 90 when I was young, that shows how old I am. And Italy looks like a foot, it looks like a boot. Well, Rome was there. How, how do roads lead to Rome? It doesn't make sense. Why? Because the word Rome that we use now, um, it also meant Constantinople. So all roads led to Rome. And so when Fatih conquers Istanbul, or Constantinople, as we should say, um, you know, um, you can see he, he then saw himself as the emperor and the people had to see him as an emperor. They had to because the local population, they were accustomed to the Byzantine culture. They were they were an imperial power. They are accustomed to 
to to this sort of practice and so Fatih from you know the, the the sultan who was moving from one place to another now becomes a sultan who is um, stationed in Constantinople and then he builds the city he feels that you know the need to build it in that sense any other questions no okay this is Selim's caliphate so 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 Selim is actually alive during the time of Fatih a lot of people don't know that you know he's actually alive so um, during Fatih's period um, what we have is this imagination of an imperial power Selim is 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 alive and Selim's father and Fatih son Bayezid um, they basically um, become the, it's a period of consolidation and then when Selim comes to power uh, he has a problem with and this picture on the right you can see um, unfortunately there's is there a way you can zoom into that picture Asim or is that a stretch possible okay, if you just give me a, a second and yeah, okay, I'll, it's fine. I'll stop presenting well, I'll, 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 what I'll do is I'll write down this for you yeah while you're doing that and I'll okay Charlie Diran. Charlie Diran was basically was selling went to war with the, uh, with the Safavids and I'll speak in more detail about the Safavids. The Safavids were um, an alternative um, Turkic um, power which was uh, that had a Shia ideology. Can you and, see that doc? Yeah it's, it's like in a corner doc but this painting was um, oh. it's okay well you can hand the PowerPoint to the kids after the the, the um, the presentation is not a problem for me and when we um, go in more detail I'll talk about this because this is um, a, a the painting is a reflection of the time where Selim defeated the Safavids and they did it in this this form this is actually I think in 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 a niche somewhere in a building um, in in Tabriz maybe and it's a really fascinating um, um, painting in showing how Selim defeated the Safavids, but not only that, if you see on the right hand side, Selim's forces, he has gunpowder, right? So this is one of the way the artillery they use is gunpowder. The, the Safavids ah, you can were, see it here. I'm just trying to show these are little cannons. Yeah, I think. yeah, so you can see that one of the successes of the Ottomans over the Safavids to some degree is that the Ottomans were one of the first, and this happens in Fatih's period. Uh, the year is 1514. Okay, so let's put this in. 1514. Okay. So um, this is the, the Ottoman success and they, the Ottomans, the Safavids and the Mughals were known as the gunpowder empires in English. But the Ottomans were the first to use gunpowder in this way and they, were, they totally blitzed the Safavids who came on horseback. And after the defeat of the Safavids, um, Selim was, there's a sense of frustration in him because he felt that the Mamluks should have held a position and the Mamluks didn't hold a position. And so what he did is he decided that on the frontier region of the Ottoman domains to um, try to push the Mamluks away from the Ottoman domains and try to keep the Mamluks at distance. And he defeats the Mamluks in 1516 at Marj Dabek. Who are, who are the Mamluks, Ustad, would you mind explaining? Well, the Mamluks are also another Turkic principality. They're a Sunni principality who are in charge of the Arab world. By and large, nominally, they've become in charge of the Arab world. So the Mamluks, Mamluk, meaning it means slave. So they were slave soldiers so in, in that sense, um, and they established their own state or principality, you could say. And the Khalifa um, Al Mutawakkil was in Cairo, and so basically the idea was was that the Khalif, the, the Khilafah, had moved from Baghdad to Cairo after the Mongol invasion. So the Abbasid had moved to Cairo as a way of surviving the Mongol invasion. The, but then under the protectorship of the Mamluks, the Mamluks were the actual dominant state, but the Khalifa was in residence in Cairo. It's a really complicated situation in that sense. right? So what Selim does is after defeating the Safavids, he decides to um, contest the Mamluk Sultanate he defeats them at Mars Darbik in 1516 and he has to, he has a decision to make. Does he go back to Istanbul or does he press ahead and go to Cairo? And his soldiers were tired actually. They were done with fighting war after war after war. 
And they said to Selim, let's just go back to Istanbul. But Selim changed, decided, no, we're going to go to Cairo. Makes his way to Cairo, defeats the Mamluks, absolutely routes them. And um, Mutawakkil, Al-Mutawakkil, the, the Caliph, is taken to Istanbul. And Selim, and the, 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 the argument is, and we'll go into detail about this when I teach it, is that um, al mutawakkil transfers the authority of the Khilafah to Selim. He accepts that Selim is the absolute power and you're in charge. And the reason why this is important is not only does Selim become a Khalifa, um, but at the same time, the Arab provinces, the Arab areas become part of the Ottoman domains. So you have what we call Turkey today, which was Anatolia. So in Turkish is Anatolia. Right? And then you had the Balkans, which I remember to you, which was the Balkans. So I've put up the map if you want to use it. Yeah, that's great, actually. The map is fantastic. It was Romeli, and then you had the, the Arab provinces, right? And it, we, they said the Hijaz. And these were how they said it in, in, in Turkish, right? So Hijaz, the Bilad Sham, and the Kahira. So the Hijaz is obviously the purple section of Makkah and Medina, as you guys can see. The Bilad Sham is basically Syria, Jordan, Palestine, and Lebanon. And then Kahire, or Kahira, um, and Misr is Egypt. And this was the, the, so this was Selim's period is the, is what you can say, the red section, okay? Um, even this purple section, it becomes part of Selim's. Um, and then the extension of the purple is Selim's son, Suleiman. They, we call him Al-Kanuni, the lawgiver in Turkish, but in English, they call him the Magnificent. And the reason why they call him the Magnificent is because even in Western, in the Western world, they recognize that he was a supreme leader because of the landmass that he just, uh, you know, took in. Uh, so imagine, look at the size of that. That's how large the Ottomans were at their pomp, right? At their their highest, which is Hungary, Baghdad, parts of Russia, um, Tripoli, which is Le Libya, Algeria, um, you know, Yemen, which is the bottom part is actually Yemen. They make their way to Yemen and so forth. This is a, a phenomenal size of authority. So Selim's nickname was Yavuz, which was like this in Turkish, which in English comes down to as the Grim. Yes, Anadolu is Anatolia. So Anadolu is what they say in in in, uh, in Turkish means Anatolia. Yavuz means the Grim. Way Grim, because he was unapologetic in the way that he would, um, you know, um, defeat his enemies. He was very focused in 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 eradicating his enemies. Um, so some of the enemies that he the Kizilbash, which was a particular group of, of, of um, they call them because they had red hat, hats, they were of a Shi inclination, the Alawis. Um, Selim was very re relentless on the Alawis, making sure that they didn't have um, major um, areas where they can um, um, stay. And, and um, uh, the Safavids and then the Mamluks. What's interesting is Suleiman, when he came to power, his son, he reversed some of these policies. Because what Selim did is that he, he kicked out many Shias from many parts of his domains and sent them to, to Persia. And many of them had to leave their properties behind. And then Suleiman, he reversed that. He said, this is unpopular. We don't need to do this. And so he brought people back. Um, but this this is now, as I said before, you, you're starting to see like the change um, in, in the Ottoman uh, dynasty in that sense. Are there before, any questions? Um, oh, okay, sorry. I'll, I'll ask a quick question and then yeah, I'll give it to the it. kids. Yeah. Selim very famously as far as i remember is he removes his father bayezid i think it's bayezid the second from the throne yeah, yeah. um in order because he doesn't feel like he's doing enough to counter the shia threat and that's why he attacks the mamluks because he doesn't feel like they're doing enough to counter yeah. the shia threat yeah so i i, I wanted to go this more in detail when the class when we do the class but we can just touch on it now so bayezid who's the son of fatih basically when he's in charge of istanbul um he has a policy of consolidation he doesn't want to get into conflict too much um, and that's because the policies of Fatih, because Fatih was in power for, um, we can say, 30 years, right? So after 30 years, people forget Fatih was in power for 30 years. After 30 years of Fatih's reign, 
um, some of the populace became quite exhausted with um, the culture of expansion, expansion, expansion. So what Bayezid does is his, when he comes to power, his power is a response to the Fatih period. And so what he does is he says, well, we're just going to take it easy for now. We're going to use diplomacy. We're going to have, you know, these sort of um, um, practices. And what happens is when Selim comes to power, he's warning his father that, listen, you're taking your eye off the ball and there's a threat coming from the east and it's a Safavid threat. And we need to do something about this because in those days, you've got to remember, there were no borders. So you could travel freely wherever you wanted. And peoples were coming to Anatolia and it was creating a, a problem for the Ottomans in regards to these peoples that are coming here. Um, and um, so Selim decides that he's going to go on the offensive. And initially his father wouldn't take action. So Selim decides to take action against his own father and tells his father to step down and put me in charge. And his father said no. And so then Selim, he basically garrisoned Istanbul and he told his father, if you don't, then I'm going to blitz you. And so then his father steps down and Selim becomes Sultan in this way. And then Selim goes after um, all the people that he thought needed to be taken out. And then the Mamluks who didn't support Selim in his war against the Safavids meant that Selim took this as an opportunity then to also go after the Mamluks. The idea is, is that probably Selim had no intention of becoming Caliph. He had no intention of going down south. Um, there's a difference of opinion here. The, the problem is he probably just wanted to get teach them a lesson on the frontier regions. But when the opportunity arose, when he defeats them at Marzabek, he then says, OK, what do we do now? Do we go back to Istanbul? Or do we push ahead? And so then he pushed ahead um, and uh, took um, op he took the opportunity to, to, to totally um, defeat the Mamluks because the Mamluks had weakened. Um, the question is, is, why did he not do that with the Safavids? And that's an interesting question that we don't have the answer to. Does anybody have any other questions about um, the Selim Suleiman period? Very quick ones. I'm sorry, I took up your guys' questions. So, and then we can move on. Does anybody want to? Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so the next period is, is what we call uh, the 17th and 18th century. And this is interesting because in the historiography, they used to present it as the period of decline. But actually what we see is that this is a period of the rise of the Janissaries and the ulama. And so the Janissaries are on the left and the ulama on the right. I love those those humongous turbans that we see um, of uh, the ulama. Actually, you know what's interesting? Um, uh, Asim, can you type this in and on the internet? Um, type in Mustafa Kamal Janissary. And the ulama and okay. I'll, I'll, I'll present the picture. So the Janissaries basically was in the early period of Ottoman history. The Ottomans needed, um, so what you, you had is you had initially during the Ghazal period, you had the soldier which was a Sifat, right? And this was regular soldiers who people who were fighting with the Ottomans, right? The people died in war and so forth. And so the Ottomans needed a, a professional unit to fight on their behalf. You couldn't continuously just just um, uh, motivate people to fight for you all the time. So the Ottomans created what they called the Janissary Unit, which was basically that, yes, I, I want you to see this picture. The, um, the Janissary Unit, the Ottomans created that. Basically, it was from the Dev Shirme system, and we'll talk about that in detail later. Um, and basically, um, they were taking children from defeated non-Muslim peoples who didn't surrender and these children were yes it was a standing army that's very fantastic thanks for that um, and basically the these um, kids would convert to Islam and they would become a standing army unit which was getting paid um, and they became an organized outfit and initially this is how the Ottomans were able to increase their numbers in the military class by using this standing army um, in this way by the 17th century the Janissaries become a, a, a power and a force in of themselves, okay? And they become an independent unit in which before um, uh, they used to fight wars for the Ottomans, but now they would choose who would be Khalifa and who wouldn't. That was very interesting in this period. And in the 17th and 18th century, we see the ulama um, enforcing the idea of what they call juristic law. The emphasis that the Khalifa 
and the Sultan is not above the Sharia. And they emphasize that. So the Janissaries and the ulama in this period is really intriguing. They become far more prominent as institutions in the system um, to some degree, and they became a counter, a check on absolute sultanic authority. This picture of Mustafa Kemal is very famous because when in, and we'll talk about this later, but in 1826, when Mustafa, um, Mahmoud II abolished the Janissary, he didn't want any memory of the Janissaries to the point he even destroyed their tombs. He destroyed everything. He didn't want people to remember the Janissaries at all. And in a, in, in a, in a costume party, Mustafa Kemal, uh, during the um, Young Turk period, he, he dressed up as a, a, as a Janissary. I, I don't know the date exactly what he dressed like this, but this is a famous picture of him dressed as a Janissary with the you know, extraordinary, exaggerated Janissary hat. Um, in that sense, but um, it's one of the few pictures that people see because if you if you guys ever come to Istanbul I'll show you one tomb. There's one tomb in Istanbul that still exists of a Janissary tomb Because Mahmoud wiped them out. There's actually an interesting tomb that you guys might find interesting uh, Tipu Sultan sent one of his uh, um, um, What do you call it? Um, messengers to Istanbul for help and he died here and he's got um, He's got his tomb here and it's the hat of Mesur He's wearing um, as the tomb, which is really fascinating. And tomb culture is really intriguing in the Ottoman period. So what we see in the 17th, 18th century is the rise of the ulama and the Janissaries as an internal opposition to the absolute authority of the Sultan. Um, and this emerges so that the Sultan, in this period, we had a lot of young Sultans, like 13 years old, 14 years old, um, because parents were dying and people were dying young. And these Sultans would be influenced by people around them and so the emergence of the ulama and the janissary comes into play and th these are really fascinating costumes that you see them wearing um, one of the interesting things about a uniform um, a lot of mad sultans do that is true a lot of mad sultans do the one of the interesting things about a uniform is uniforms are important in islam or in that particular period in ottoman history because a uniform is an indication of your authority and your distinctive distinctiveness in a society right so when you see a policeman they wear a uniform and when you go to um, you know um, I don't know when you go to court the judge wears a uniform and when you go to a hospital the nurse and the doctors wear a uniform and uniform culture is very important in this sense because it makes you distinct and people know who you are and even in Islam we have this idea of wearing a particular style of clothing as a reflection and a representation of the culture and background that you come from and in the Ottoman period, even your tombs were shaped in a way so that people knew what you belonged to. It's a way of maintaining a, a identity in life and maintaining a memory and identity even in death. In this sense, and this is important in that sense. And when the Turkish Republic removed these uniforms from people and tried to, you know, make them one thing, you can see the problems it creates. Um, so Islam doesn't have a problem with that in that sense. All right, we can go on to the next section. The reform, uh, Oh, you have a question, go for it. Um, no, I'm just, uh, Ray asked a question about the yeah. Janissaries. So they became like a standing army? He's... Yeah, that's what, yeah, I, yeah. And that's what I said, he was right. They came, like, became like a standing army. You start to see a transition in the Muslim period. You know, there's only so many people you can encourage to fight for you, the, the expansion. And people want to settle down. People want to become sedentary. People want to get married. Um, you can't continuously keep motivating people to... So to have a standing army became necessary. But how do you have a standing army? How do you create one? So the system they use is the Dev Shirme system, which I'll teach in detail. Um, but the Janissaries are really important to understand the emergence of what we would call a military class in of itself in Islamic history. Some would say a military industrial complex of their own. Yeah, 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 yeah. They did have that. And, um, you know, they had their own, um, uh, what you would call uh, cafes, like where they were selling coffee to each other. They were part of the guilds. Um, because to some degree, um, when the Ottoman state couldn't afford to pay the money, um, then they started to establish their own uh, independent ways of earning money, which that's then created what, other problems. That's a nice way of putting it, independent ways of earning money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what can you say? Okay, so reform and collapse. This is a, the, the end, okay, the, the, the last period. When the Ottoman, when the, when the Janissaries in particular were no longer being able to compete. So you saw the uniforms the Janissaries are wearing, right? 
And so now we start to see a shift in European power, European technology, the industrial revolution. Um, it changed everything. It changed the game and co co colonialism and so forth. And the Ottomans didn't have a military that could compete with the Western forces, especially the Russians in trying to defeat them. And so what we had is, this is a the Tanzimat edict in particular, this, oh, it's, this picture is not necessary. I just, I don't know why I put it in there. But you, can go to the, you can go to the next one. The picture you include is a lot better. Yeah, these two. So this is Salim on the left, Salim the third, known as the Mujaddid. And uh, this is Mahmoud the second, known as the just. Um, and what's interesting is Salim, under Salim's reign, Okay, we can ask them actually, this might be nice. What do you guys think is, is the distinction between the two pictures? What stands yeah. out to you? Yeah, 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 it's great. Yeah, yeah, cool. Between the picture on the left and the right, the depiction of the sultans, what's changed or if anything? Adi, you always come and, and get the right answer and just ruin everything for everybody else. Why do you let people <laughs> guess and get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Anybody else? You can add in any of the ideas that you have, specifics if you want to point out. I'm assuming you guys are still with us, right? <laughs> we're still, they're still here. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead, Doc. I think, yeah. Uh, wait, uh... Uh, yeah, we're... yeah, so, um, okay, so this is interesting. So, Selim. The one on uh, the one on the right is standing, and the one on the left, the one on the, that is the one on the left is stand. Okay, all right, let's go. So the one on the left is Selim. Okay, and Selim comes before Mahmoud. So the one on the right, he comes after. The one on the left, you can see, is a very Turkic style painting. Look at his turban. He has an exaggerated turban in terms of uh, uh, representing himself. He is indeed seated, and so forth. It looks pretty And the way that well. this painting is done is is in a very traditional style. In the portrait style. Now, what we see here on the right is Mahmoud, and there is a picture of Mahmoud looking like Selim, but then Mahmoud trying to become um, a representative of being a sultan in the image of what the Europeans had in terms of their monarchy. And so you're, you're right. He's standing. This painting is done by a European, by the way. He's standing the the way that he's wearing a modern, what you would call, uniform. To some degree, which looks like a military uniform that a, a Napoleon would be wearing, and this is in, important to remember that the impact of Napoleon and the Napoleonic invasions on Egypt um, changed everything in the way that the Ottomans saw themselves. But on his head, he's wearing a fez; he's not wearing a turban, and it, it was controversial um, in regards to implementing the fez, which is the hat. And the reason being is because the Ottomans needed a new um, headgear for war. The turban in, in, in on the battlefield was so easy to see that, you know, in, in terms of the weight of it, the Ottoman soldiers were just being killed for the fact that they were wearing turbans. So Mahmoud wanted to create a new style of headgear for his new military class, and he decided to um, institutionalize the fez. Now, you can't institutionalize the fez if you don't wear the fez. So then he wore the fez, and usually what would happen is what happened at the top would trickle down into society. And so this painting is of him in wearing the fez. What's intriguing is that pose is often taken from Napoleon, um, the way that they stand. And you know what's interesting? I don't know if you guys know this, but my dad, when he stands for photos, he stands like he's going to take a picture like these two guys here. Because in the olden days, uh, photography, the culture of photography was taken from this style of portrait painting that you look like because a person would stand in front of a painting for hours and hours and someone would do a painting. And then when photos are taken, our, our parents would stand like this too because they took it from the portrait culture. Now we do it differently because we can take selfies and we have, you know, some of us have Instagram and whatnot. So now we, we don't care about posing for pictures. But my, my dad, even today, when I tell him to take a picture, he does this, he poses, he sits there like that because it comes from this culture. But the idea of the picture on the right is to show the modernization that's taken place from Mahmoud's period from Selim's period. As you can see a shift between one sultan and another of the need of modernization. And this painting is supposed to be a reflection. It's supposed to show you how the modernize in. If you can visually see modernization, then it changes. Now, a lot of people were critical 
because they were suggesting that this is an indication that um, uh, you know they're becoming Europe European, they're becoming Western to some degree. But that's why Mahmoud insisted on having a fez and not a hat with a beak on it, because the cap with a beak. The pro there's two problems with that. The first problem is is that you never take off your hat as a soldier. The soldier always has his hat on, even when he's praying. But if a soldier's praying with his beak on, he can't pray, he can't do sujud. You don't have a beak. The mm. second reason is, is that if you had to kiss the hand of the sultan, you can't kiss the hand of the sultan with a beak on your head. Um, so the flat hat is necessary. So they took this, the fez from Morocco, because in Turkish, fez, fuzz, is from the city of fez. So, Dr. Yaqub, is there anything conspic like their body shape? I don't know if that's because one's like really, I don't know, was there a change because there's an abandonment of the warrior culture? So was there a, an attempt to sort of bring that back? Like the yes, Sultan's definitely. not going to sit on it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. So um, one of the things that when we talked about the Janissaries in particular is that the Sultans came to be known as sedentary, right? Those sedentary means people who just sit around and they don't go to war. Sultan Ahmed, I mean, no, Genj Osman. Genj Osman. So Sultan Ahmed was the first Sultan who didn't go to war, right? He couldn't go on the Ghazal. And as a result of that, he built the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, right? Um, so one of the interesting things about the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, the Muslims didn't want That's, a mosque. That's uh, the Ahmed. Blue Mosque, right? The Just Blue Mosque. Case. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want a Blue Mosque because they got Hagia Sophia. So they felt it wasn't necessary. But what Sultan Ahmed wanted to do, because he was going to be known as the first Sultan who didn't go on the, on the Ghazal, he built a mosque and he built a mosque with six minarets and that was controversial because the only mosque that had six minarets was the Prophet Rasulullah's mosque in Medina and so when he built six minarets they built an extra seventh minaret in Medina so that the Prophet's mosque can have seven and he had six and it was the only mosque in Turkey and Istanbul in the Ottoman domains that had six minarets because you'll see that there's either four minarets or two minarets and it's interesting the Ottoman mosques if you have four minarets you're usually a Sultan and if you have two minarets, it means you're a grand vizier, you're uh, the mother of a sultan, or so forth, in the earlier Ottoman period. So this was necessary. So in the 19th century, after Selim um, dies, it becomes important that the, the, the sultans, they look like military statesmen as well. And that the Ottomans are a military power, and that they are an imperial military power. And so on the left, we have Abdul Majid and Abdul Aziz. The, the sultans of the Tanzimat period and um, the one on the right is Abdul Hamid the, the second um, now the, once again um, you can see these are actually the one in the middle of Abdul Aziz is actually a photograph which they've painted in but the one of Abdul Hamid is a painting um, there are very few pictures of Abdul Hamid you know what actually wait, I don't know if you can let me see. I bought this a few days ago where is it? Let me see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Bismillah. So I, w I, I have a habit of um, going to antique shops. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you see that? Can you see it? Yep. I, yeah, we can see it. That's... Um, it's Sultan Abdul Hamid II, yeah? And it's actually... Uh, I don't know if you guys can see the back of it. It's actually um, an <laughs> advert for chocolate. So it's a, it's, a, it's a chocolate advertisement and uh, oh Saman you're leaving me? Oh man, oh man, he's actually going. All right, so this is a chocolate advert and what I found fascinating about this, which you guys are going to think what, what's so great about this, is the idea that chocolate, a chocolate advertisement has a picture of the Sultan on it as a way of promoting it. Why? Because in those days, the sultans were the superstars. They were the celebrities, right? To be a celebrity meant you had to be a sultan. Now, idols, everyone's a, a celebrity now. But in those days, it was the image of the sultan that you'd put on something to be able to, to promote the value of something. And this is Abdul Hamid, which I found fascinating. So I, I picked this up uh, from an antique shop for £20. Was there any chocolate with it? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> I think it's uh, out of date. <laughs> like a hundred years out of date. <laughs> I don't even know. Does, does chocolate go old? Does it, does it get fungus? I don't even know. Allah. <laughs> I know that honey doesn't. SubhanAllah. Honey never goes, it never goes off. It's a miracle of Allah. The honey never goes off. So anyway, vintage chocolate. Yeah. All right. So um, 
the, the race i'm going to come to your question in a second so basically these what i wanted to show you was these were the sultans of of the the islah period um the reformation period and there's an assumption that um um you know that islam was in decline but actually these sultans in particular um they put an emphasis on islam and i think this is necessary to understand that that during the reform period um, the emphasis on islam cannot be denied abdul majid the first one on the left is the father of sultan abdul hamid and abdul aziz the one in the center is the uncle of abdul hamid and what i wanted to show you as well in the paintings is they have different phases on each sultan had his own fez style um, so the one in the middle is my favorite fez style is the aziziya fez and the one on the right is the hamidiya fez so even in their fez styles they, they had their own fez styles in this in the way that they they, they wore their hats in that sense um we can go to the next slide because we'll talk about this in detail when i see you and yeah after uh, abdul hamid there's a there's a revolution to take abdul hamid away from power and what we start to see is the introduction of the balkan wars and world war one and i i really want to go into detail when we have the class on world war one so that you appreciate and understand exactly what went wrong i think this is the key thing of understanding what happened here because never before in the modern period have we seen a war of this scale and this was absolutely devastating for the Muslims. My personal opinion, and this isn't just my personal opinion, I think there are four incidences for Muslims which we really need to do proper research on. The collapse of Andalusia, the transatlantic slave trade, the occupation of India, and the collapse of the Ottomans. These four periods of where Muslims faced absolute violence is unprecedented in history. And these four periods are really, they create a particular catalyst of how Muslims ought to be viewed. When you see like the collapse of Andalusia, the way that Muslims were dehumanized, the transatlantic slave trades where the majority of the slaves were Muslims, the, um, the, the colonization of India, when India was the richest area in the world at the time, and the collapse of the Ottomans, of which we see the combustion of the Muslim world and the creation of nation states. These are all key milestone moments for me, um, my personal opinion, and I really do hope that we can um, investigate this in regards to how Muslims had been continuously scarred in terms of these extreme moments of violence against Muslims to shape the current world that we live in. And the Ottomans lost a lot of land in World War I because they were fighting on too many fronts. They were fighting the Russians, the French and the British. And the Ottomans had a defensive war, but they had no choice but to side with the Germans. Going to yeah, that's true, that before um, going to America, that one-tenth of the slaves were Muslims. Actually, there's a wonderful book called The Walking Quran, if any of you are interested. And what it indicates is that a lot of the, the slave revolts happened by, by, by Muslims, and they were ulama in particular, who, who, who were revolting against the, the Americans. And there's a lot of things in American culture that we don't appreciate that have been taken from Islamic culture. The blues and jazz, for example, were taken from black people who were um, accustomed to um, reciting Quran and so forth. It came from that culture. Um, a lot of, we noticed that a lot of black women who were, um, they were stripped naked when they were working. And then when they were given permission to put on their clothes, they would cover their hair. And they didn't know why they were doing that, but it's because they were raised in a culture of hijab, of wearing the hijab and so forth. There's so many things in the Americas in regards to Muslims and black slaves in particular, that has really been taken, smashed out the memory. And the reason why I wanted to mention these four instances is because violence and memory is fascinating. When you use extreme violence, one of the ways of, of taking an idea out of people is to use extreme forms of violence against them. So one of the ways that you get Muslims to forget of Islam is that when you create in, 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 um, incidents or times of extreme violence, you can smash it out of a particular generation by creating fear. And so Andalusia, the transatlantic slave trade, the colonization of India and the Ottoman Empire is an indication of how extreme forms of violence were used to take Islam out of people. But alhamdulillah, in the case of India and the Ottomans in particular, Islam was so deeply ingrained. And because um, Muslims are still there, that um, you know we still have Islam in that sense. And the buildings, they tried to remove buildings by destroying them, but they were unable to, to do so. So World War I was detrimental and the loss of World War I was what created, um, I would say, the formation of the nation states and then the world that we live in today, unfortunately. 
Now, Asim, you had a picture that you wanted to... We, uh, did we have the picture? This is actually from the Balkan Wars. Okay, but this is fascinating because um, um, this is a what we would call Muslim. Um, we don't know of what origin, maybe Turkish, Albanian, maybe Bulgarian Muslim. But um, he, was, he was hung by the Bulgarians because he was caught as a prisoner of war. But he was allowed to do wudu. So there's another picture where he's actually doing wudu in a bowl. Right? He's actually doing wudu in a bowl. And, and he was allowed to pray. And then they hung him um, in that context. And he, as you can see, he's wearing the traditional fez. And, the, and he's wearing what we call the shalwar, as we know. And um, the shalwar is um, important because we don't see people very often wearing the shalwar in Turkish culture, um, unfortunately, because now they are dressed in a more Western style. But here is a gentleman who's still wearing the shalwar. And I mean, I, I honestly, wallahi, I, I love his shirt. This picture is actually in black and white. And they've colorized this picture. It was taken in 1912, 1913 in the Balkan Wars. But this is a, a, a beautiful picture, um, you know, in, in this context, um, in this way. Um, yes, it's true that prisoners of war, by and large, were not allowed to be killed. But I don't know this particular gentleman's specific story, if I was to be honest with you, Ali. I don't know what happened here. And there's a lot of gaps regarding this story. But the, the, we say in English that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And this picture here is, is fascinating because it really um, brought to the imagination of what was happening in the war. And we have very interesting pictures in this sense. And this is a very powerful image um, in this sense and um, in terms of what, what, what was happening. And uh, this, was, uh, this picture re-emerged a few years ago and then was put on the internet and it captured people's imagination in that sense. And um, yeah, it's fascinating. And even the people in the back and so forth. I mean, this one guy, you know, subhanAllah, ma'ala ta'ala, you know, give him jannah. So by and large, this was the overview. I know, I know I've, 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 I've smashed you guys with a lot of information in two hours. 600 years of history in two hours. I'm aware of that. But what I was trying to do in many ways is just to give you a, a brief overview of, of, of sort of like what we're going to talk about. So that when I talk about it in detail, at least you have a rough idea and understanding of what was taking place um, and but don't worry when we go into those details I'm going to I'm going to break it down bit by bit we, we can't teach everything so I'm going to these what these are the key things that I want to teach you I want to teach you how it began I want to teach you Fatih and Selim's conquest I want to teach you about the, the, the Janissaries and the ulama and then I want to teach you about how it fell apart and the ending so that you have at least a, a, a grasp of the key areas of, of, of that period is that okay? Any other questions? Alhamdulillah.